the Lord for another Sunday. Amen. And our dear mother, you are welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless you. Amen. We also thank the Lord for the wonderful Bible study. Amen. The discussions were very nice. Amen. Amen. God be glorified. Amen. Amen. Also, we thank the Lord for the wonderful testimonies Amen. and what He's doing in the ministry and what He's going to do. Amen. 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 We started a series on understanding sufferings. A series on understanding sufferings. Why it's important for Christians to understand our call to suffer. That as Christians, you have not only been called, like Paul put it, to joy in the glory of God, but also to boast in tribulations, to boast in suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. What Paul the Apostle says when he wrote an epistle to the saint at Corinth. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 18 to 19, he says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So God is saying that if you want to be wise in the eyes of God, you have no alternative than to be a fool in this world. Being wise in the eyes of God will make you a fool in this world. It is just a matter of choice. As a Christian, you can, be, you can choose to be wise in the eyes of God or be wise in this world. But God is saying to a servant that if you choose to be wise in the eyes of God, you will have to be a fool. People will see you as weak and naive, but that is what it costs you to walk in the wisdom of God. Because the wisdom of this world is opposed to God's wisdom. The systems of this world, they are opposed to God's wisdom. So you will not have it any other way. You will not have it any other way. Now, today, I want us to look at certain important things when it comes to our suffering. Now, when we go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul wrote the epistle of, uh, to the Corinth before Philippians. The epistle to the Corinthians was one of the early epistles he wrote. And it was in his second epistle to the Corinthians that he was going through certain afflictions. He actually says that a messenger of Satan, a fallen angel from Satan was sent to buffet him was sent to cause afflictions and tribulations to him. And Paul says that regarding this, I, I sought the Lord three times. But the Lord Jesus said to Paul, my power, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So before he wrote this epistle to these Philippians, he understood that from the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus said that if you want to walk in my power, if you want my power to be perfected in you, then you have to suffer. You have to partake in the Christ sufferings. So now, with that understanding, when he wrote to the Philippians, he says, that I may know him. So here he mentions, he, he points to knowledge, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now, when you read the Bible, there are triplets of truth and also duplets of truths. And one of the triplets of truth are these three things, that knowledge is linked to power, and power is linked to sufferings. These three things, they go hand in hand. Knowledge goes with power, 
and power goes with sufferings. These three always go hand in hand when it comes to our Christian life and our Christian work. So, for instance, when you go back to the Second Corinthians chapter twelve, when he mentions about the revelations given to him, he goes on and talks about the sufferings he went through because of that, and also the Lord Jesus mentions power. So there you see that power is mentioned, revelations is mentioned, and also sufferings are mentioned. So these three they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. So when you read Second Corinthians chapter twelve, where it says that he knew a man who, whether it was a close vision or uh, or not, but he was talking about a close vision. He says that I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God know it. So such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God know it. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And as we know, he was talking about himself. Says, and he goes on to say, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear. Lest any man should think of me above that which is yet me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelation. So here he mentions revelation. And he said that because of this revelation, that this knowledge says there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul here mentions knowledge, and he says that a thorn, you, you receive a thorn in his flesh, that is, he was talking about reproaches and afflictions because of knowledge, because of revelation, which cometh from God. Then he goes on to say, For this thing I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God, Jesus said, My power is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, because of this, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So in this chapter of the book of Corinthians, he mentions, he, he links the three again, knowledge to power and also power to sufferings. So power, sufferings, and knowledge, like he, he linked it also in Philippians, they are tied together. Again, when he also goes to Hebrews chapter 10, and this is for every Christian. It's for every Christian. The more you grow in your knowledge with, of God, and this is a knowledge, not talking about just a mental knowledge, a knowledge that you become part of. That means that you are going to live out this knowledge. So the more you grow in that kind of revelational knowledge, you are going to face persecutions. It is for every Christian. So when you read Hebrews chapter 10, verse from verse 32, this was to the church, the Jewish church. He says, But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. That great fight of affliction came after they were illuminated. After knowledge came to them, that is when these afflictions came. So the Lord Jesus said, says that persecutions and tribulations, they come because of the word. They come because of the word. So, as a Christian, you may be, a, you, you suffer in different ways. You can be a, suffer because you are a wife in a Christian marriage. You may suffer because you are a servant and you have a master. You may suffer because you are a leader. The sufferings comes in different ways comes in different ways. But why these sufferings? Why these sufferings? It's because of why we are on this earth. 
When we go to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. When God looks at his children, what does he see? Why are we here? How he has arranged and planned our life. It's for what purpose? Paul says, from whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So every Christian, you have been conformed, you have been predestined to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. To be like the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we go to Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Paul says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the last thereof. So this is what the Christian journey is about. Everyone is supposed to be like the Lord Jesus Christ in character and in every way. In every way. And in that predestination to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, God plans our life to mold that character in us. So sufferings is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that we are supposed to follow. Therefore, if our life as Christians he is the standard for us to follow, then we have to look at certain things about what his Lord Jesus Christ is said. Because in everything that we do, he is the standard. He's the reference point for us to follow. So when we go to John chapter 15, Jesus says certain important things to his disciples, having a foreknowledge that they will go, they will suffer because of their Christian work. When we read from the verse 16, John chapter 15 from verse 16, the master says, says, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Then he goes on, says, these things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hates you, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. This is very important for Christians to understand that the Christian, if you are going through persecution, if the world they are pursuing you, first understand that they pursue your Lord before you. And because you are not greater than him, that is why you will have to humble yourself to go through that. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Please, next verse. It says, if you were of the world, the world will love his own. The Lord always loves his own. The world will always love his own. And that is why when a Christian becomes carnal, the world will love them. The world always loves their own. So if the Lord says, if you were of the world, the world will love his own. But because he goes on to give us the reason why we are persecuted. He says, But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, because you are not part of this world now as a Christian, and because of that, it means that you should not live by their wisdom, but by divine wisdom. He says, Because of that, because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Remember the word that I said unto you. It says the servant is not greater than his Lord. So he is our Lord and he went through a lot. Therefore this becomes a word of comfort for you the Christian when you are suffering because of righteousness. He says that the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Why will he say this? Because as a Christian, whether you are a preacher or at any level, you are mandated and obligated to only speak the word of God, only speak the mind of Jesus and act according to his word. So if they persecuted the word, then they will persecute you too. But then if you go on preaching your opinions and living out your opinion, then they will not persecute you. That's why there are even some preachers and Christians who are not persecuted. They live always in a comfortable zone because they preach and act out their own opinions. But those who say, 
that we will preach the word, we will live according to the word, we will stand for his word, they will persecute you. Because like Jesus said, the persecution comes not because they hate you, but because of the word. Like last week as we were looking at, they never hate you. The word is not you that they hate. It's the word that they hate. It's Jesus, the Lord that you, your master is the one that they hate. For instance, if you are rich as a Christian, God has prospered you, and people are envious of you. It's not because of you as you being rich that they hate. It's because of what the word has done in your life. Tomorrow be poor like them, you will see how they will love you. They will love you if you are at their level. So it's not you that they hate. They hate you because of what the word of God is doing in your life. So always you have to put in your mind that it's not you that they hate. They never they don't hate you. They never hate you. For instance, if you are standing for the word of God and they are persecuting you tomorrow, start talking like them and acting like them. They become your friends. So it's never about us. They hate us because of the word. And last, like Brother Ben mentioned, when we read the Bible study, like uh, for instance, Acts chapter 9. Why did the master say they are pursuing me? Because he, know, he knew that it's not because of them, it is because of the word. They pursue us because of the word, of the word. So why is it important for you to have this in your mind as your consciousness? So that you can love them and respond in the right way. Because if you don't have this in your mind, that it's not you that they hate, but the word, then also you can be better. Because they will insult you and they will say all kinds of evil things about you. And you are not careful. Tomorrow when you meet them, you cannot talk to them. You also have some bitterness in your heart against them. But if you know our mind, we know that it's not about us. It's about the Christ. That you say the sufferings of Christ. Then no matter what you go through, you know that it's not because of me. It's because of the Christ in me. And therefore you can what? Respond in the way that we are supposed to respond. So he says, remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So he says, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. He says, but all these things would they do unto you for my name's sake. Because they, so he refers always that it's because of him and not because of us. It's because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sent. This is also very important that as Christians, God is not going to judge us and measure us the same way. What knowledge came to you is very important. See, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sent. But now they have no proof for their sin. No pretense for their sin because knowledge came to them. Please, next verse. It says, He that hated me hated my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated, hated both me and my father. But this came to pass that the word might be fulfilled. That, it, that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. They hated me without a reason. Therefore, they will hate you also without a cause. Just because you stand for God's way, they will hate you. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So the Lord shed his words of wisdom with us so that we have it at the back of our mind no matter what we go through we have it at the back of our mind now please let's look at something in philippians chapter 2 philippians chapter 2 jesus is our example paul says follow me as i follow christ so we follow him he shows us the way the way of righteousness the way of righteousness. He shows us the way, the walk of righteousness. So he becomes our standard. Our standard in everything. So when you read from the verse 5, verse 5, these are instructions to the Christians. It says, let this mind be in you, 
which was also in Christ Jesus. So he said that we should let this mind be in us. So what do you do as a Christian? What is going to say that becomes your mindset as a Christian? It's not just us quoting those parts of scriptures, but it says that uh, renew your mind with what I'm going to say. This should be your mindset, the state of your mind as you live on this earth. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And it says, who be in the form of God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus was God. He was the Word. The Word was God. He was part of the Trinity. But the Bible says when he found himself in the role as a man, he lived according to how men were supposed to live in relation to God. So you can be a Christian. You can be at any level. But when you find yourself as a wife, God is saying that you may be a CEO. Your husband may be even be uneducated. But when you find yourself as a wife, the same way when Jesus found himself in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and, and, and lived according to what was expected of a man. God also expects the same from you. We can be at any level, but if you find yourself in any role, what God expects of that one in, in that role, you are supposed to do that. So always you live with that consciousness towards God. Where have I been placed at any time? Any, in any particular point in life where you find yourself is how you go by. It's how you, you can be a minister, but when you are talking to people who are old enough to be your mothers, you have to understand and relate with them in a way you should relate with a mother. So when you read, for instance, First Timothy chapter 5, Paul advised Timothy in that. So it's not about any human being. It's about Jesus and what he wants. It's about Jesus and what he wants. When you read First Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, Timothy was a pastor. He was the minister, the shepherd of that church in Ephesus. But what did Paul say to him? He says, Repeat not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the young men as brethren. So that is how it is. He is God. He decides. And we live out that life that he expects of us. So Jesus becomes the standard. And that is why Jesus said that the Father loved him so much. He, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now we can look at John chapter 10 and, and observe something about the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. His mindset. Why the Father loved him so much. He was always focused on doing the will of God. What would please the Father in any area of his life, he just wanted to please God. His joy was in pleasing the Father. That is how you live as a Christian. When we John chapter 10 from verse 17, it says, Therefore do my Father love me. Because of this reason, do my Father love me. It says, Because I lay down my life that I may take it again. It says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. What is Jesus saying here? He says, No man kill him. That's why he's trying to tell the Christian. No man kill Jesus Christ. That's what Christians will understand. No man killed Jesus Christ. He offered himself to die. Because he would have said, I will not die. No Roman Gentile could have killed him. No Roman soldier could have killed him. How could he have killed life? 
how could it have killed life? So here it shows you that they were able to take his life from him because he allowed that, not because they were stronger than him. And he gives us the reason why he did that. He says, because I received a commandment from my father. So he says, no man take it from me, but I of my own accord lay it down of myself. I have the authority to lay it down and have authority to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. So he also tells the Christian in John chapter 15, say, if you love me, keep my commandments. Loving him is not about singing songs and praising him every day. The true worship and praise is in our lifestyle. Yes, you must praise God, you must worship him, but the most important is are we living according to his word? Are we obeying his commandment? That's why it says in Luke chapter 6, they call me Lord, Lord, but they don't do what I tell them. I see them in church praising me every time, singing songs, mentioning my name, but what I tell them to do, they don't do it. So for him, when it comes to you loving him, it's about doing or in carrying out his orders, what he wants us to do. What he wants us to do. Now, Paul says something which is very important, which will help us in our life as we want to partake of that sufferings which is in Christ. James and Paul said we should count it joy when we go through diverse afflictions and tribulations. From what angle can you count every tribulation as joy? It means you have to relate from that perspective of the spirit. You cannot live after the flesh or in accordance to the flesh and we will be able to count afflictions as joyful. So when a Christian, you are after the flesh, you are fleshly minded, it will be very difficult to joy in tribulations. So the Christian is not supposed to be fleshly minded because in Galatians, Paul helps us to understand in Galatians chapter five that the flesh is opposed to the spirit. The flesh, the pleasure, the lust of the flesh is opposed to the spirit. And that is why always when you are in the flesh, then when you find someone insults you, 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 you respond in the same way. You render evil for evil. You cannot be in the flesh and someone slaps you and you will not what, reply in the same manner. Because the flesh is opposed to the spirit. It says that these two, they are contrary to one another. They are contrary to one another. So Paul shows us this. If you want to read Romans chapter 1, verse 9, how he worshiped and served God. How he lived out the gospel. What is the gospel? When you say the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, what is expected of every Christian? How are we supposed to live the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? He says, when you read Romans chapter 1, verse 9, he says, For God is my witness. Whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. So the gospel, Christianity, means servitude by spirit. You are serving God with your spirit. If you serve God from the perspective or standpoint of the flesh, it will be very difficult to live out the true Christian life. For you to live out the true Christian life, you will have to serve God with your spirit. So Paul says, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. So in Christianity, the focus should be the spirit. That is why also why he wrote to the Romans again and said in the chapter 8, and in that same book, it says that be spiritually minded. Don't be fleshly minded. Be spiritually minded. Because the Bible says that when you become a Christian, you become one spirit with God. It's in the cortex of your spirit, of your heart, that the Holy Spirit dwells. So when you live after the spirit, you are spirit minded, then you will be able to be sustained 
when you are suffering for Christ. When you are suffering for Christ. So when you, for instance, you look at Philippians chapter 3 from verse 1. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 1. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. It says, Beware of dogs. Now, here he's talking about people in the church. These are not, he's not talking about gentle dogs. He's talking about dogs in the church. He says, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. There were evil workers in the church. Beware of the circumcision. Then he goes on to say, He says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. We have no confidence in the flesh. So when you become a Christian, the flesh is dead. The flesh is supposed to have been crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you serve him in the spirit, with your spirit. So he says that I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I serve God with my spirit. It says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I the more. But it says, no, I have chosen to serve in the spirit. Because when you serve God with the flesh, then if, for instance, you, for instance, you are a very educated man or woman, and someone who may not even have been educated as you are, now start insulting you, you become proud and you want to respond in the same way. Why? Because you are serving God with the flesh. When you become fleshly minded, you cannot humble yourself to serve God the right way. But he says that we should serve God with our spirit. That's why he goes on to enumerate all the things that he had in the flesh. And at the end, he says, but I count all these things as done as nothing, so that I may win Christ. So when it comes to Jesus, Jesus, he says, in my flesh is no, Paul says, in my flesh is nothing good. You serve God with the spirit. You become spiritually minded because the Bible says that we have the spirit of Christ. And if you serve God with the spirit, no matter what is true, they throw at you, you respond the Christ way. You respond the Christ way. So it's very important. He shows us the key. He was always spiritually minded, focused on the spirit. Because the flesh will always be opposed to the spirit. The flesh will always be opposed to the spirit. Now, when we started this series, we look at certain important things. First and foremost, we look at the fact that why suffering? That God created man to reveal his attributes. God, the reason why God created man was that God wanted to reveal all his attributes through man. He, for the other creations, he revealed certain aspects of his attributes. For instance, for with angels, God reveals his power. With other creations, he reveals certain bits of his attributes. But God wanted a creature that he could reveal all of him. And that creature was man. So he created man to reveal all of his attributes. And one important attribute of God, the greatness of God, is in his weakness. God's greatness is not even in his power. The greatness of God was the ability of this great God to become a man. The ability of this, the humility of this great God to, to, to come from where he is and humble himself to be a man. That is the greatness of God. That is the greatness of God. And he was able to what? Lower himself this much, even though he's so great. He's so great. There are even no words to describe his greatness, but he was able to humble himself that is the greatness of God. Now, for man, for us to reveal all of God, it is demanded of us to be first nothing, to become everything. If you want to be everything, you have to be nothing. Now, this is what Satan wanted. 
But that is what Jesus had made possible for the Christian. Satan wanted to be like God, but he wanted to be, he didn't want to follow the process. He wanted to use pride to attain that. And that is why he was, he, he, he got what he got. But it's not that God didn't want to share. You know, sometimes there are certain uh, preachers who, who, when we say certain things, they say that, oh, you want to take God's glory. God himself wanted to share. Of course, you are not God. If you are a Christian, God living in you does not make you God. But God wanted to share his glory with the Christian. So when we read John chapter 17, Jesus said, the glory that you have given me, I have given them. Even Paul said in Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Meaning that before sin came, God's purpose, his plan, was for man to demonstrate his glory. So God wants his children to reveal his glory. That is the love of God. All that he has, he wants to share with his children. But will you follow the process? Satan couldn't follow the process. And also Adam and Eve, they couldn't follow the process. In the Garden of Eden, God, in, in his infinite plan, has destined man to be the one who will judge even fallen angels. Please let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 1. So all while the serpent came and was tempting uh, 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 Adam and Eve with, it was in God's greater plan to give that to them. But they didn't have patience. Patience means following the process. Patience means following the process. When God says that you are patient, that's always the Bible says in due time. Be patient until the due time. It means that you are following the process. When you will not follow the process, it means pride. It means pride. But if you follow the process in due time, the Bible says you always exalt those who are patient. It says, there are any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. And it says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? So the Christians will judge the world with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if the world, and if the world, sorry, shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matter? So in God's plan, man was supposed to judge these fallen angels. When you read the book of Revelations, John also talked about that. Now for you to be a judge, you should know both evil and good. There isn't any judge who doesn't know evil and good. You have to know evil and good before you can be a judge. So in God's plan, that tree of knowledge of good and evil, one day should have allowed man to partake of it. But for that time being, he said to them, don't eat it. Don't eat it. So please, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. When you read Genesis chapter 2 from verse 15 it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So God here says that of every tree, meaning that the man could have take, partook of the tree of life. There was a tree of life in the garden, and God didn't say you can't eat of the tree of life. Of every tree of the garden, you can eat. That means freely eat. Then he goes on. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So it's only one tree that God commanded man not to eat in the, at that instance. But there was the tree of life. 
So meaning that man, Adam and Eve, they could have eaten of the tree of life. But it's the same thing that has played out over the years, over and over. Like he told the Jews, I have set before you life and death. Then he says, choose life, but they chose death. So here too, he set before man life and death. These are allegories, these are the typology. He said before man life and death, but man chose death. But man could have eaten of what? Of life. God didn't say that don't eat of the tree of life. Of every tree that can eat. But don't eat of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Meaning that man could have partook of the tree of life. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He rather went for the wrong tree. Then from the 17, he says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Please, let's go to the chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, God has said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So God didn't say that, but this is how Satan, he, he, knows, he knew that God didn't say that. That is how also he comes tempting Christians these, in these times. Is it like John calls him the old serpent. It's the same strategy. It's the same strategy. Says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. The woman went on to add something that God didn't say. And that's why when you're a Christian also, when God gives you, say something, you either take out or you add something, many times it leads to problems. Because God told the man, when you read it from the chapter 2, he says you should dress the trees. You should dress all the trees, but don't eat. God didn't say don't touch. If you're going to dress that tree of the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you are going to touch it. What was said, I don't partake of the fruit from that tree. But the woman went on to say and added that neither shall ye touch it. But God didn't say so. God says, Don't eat. God didn't say, Don't touch the tree. He said, Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God do know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, after he was beguiled, and took of the fruit and gave it to Adam to, to eat. Let's see what God says. Now, the serpent said, The day you eat of your eyes should be open, you shall watch, know good and evil, and become like what? Like gods. Please, from the verse 22. God, and God said, said, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. So God is saying that what the serpent said was, was right in that sense. In that sense, when he says that if you eat of it, you become like God, knowing good and evil. God here attested to that truth, that that one is right. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So God knows good and evil, but it didn't lead to death. 
But when Adam knew good and evil, there was a problem. Why? Because it's important for you to first have the life of God before you know good and evil. So if the man had took of the tree of life before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, everything would have been okay. That should have been the order. But he didn't have the life of God, but he went forth to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's where the problem came from. But God wanted man to follow the process. It's the same thing with the law. When they didn't have, and Paul addressed this in Romans chapter 7, he says that the law which was good, the law which was good became evil unto me. Why? Because the law brought knowledge of good and evil. And since he didn't have the life, man, the Jews didn't have the life in nature of God, then rather in obeying, to obey, rather in to obey the commandments, they rather found themselves breaking the commandments. So when you don't have the life and nature of God and knowledge of good and evil come to you, it brings what? Evil to you. It's the same thing that God has been dealing with man. And it's very important. So there was a process. We are, so, we are supposed to follow the process. And in following the process, it involves what? Sufferings and following the process involves suffering. It means that what he tells you to do, you have to do it. It's not what you want to do. So the Bible, one instruction that God gives to men of God, he says that if you're a man of God, make sure not to be self-willed. Please let's look at Titus. Titus. There are many men of God nowadays and Christians who are self-willed. They rather want to teach their opinions and what makes sense to them and what they like to one another and to their congregants. And God says, if anyone, Paul says, if anyone is like that, he's not qualified to be a leader. Now, when you tell them to, then they become angry. But it's in the word of God. It's in the word of God. When you read Titus chapter 1 from verse 6, says, if any be blameless, please, let's start reading from the verse 5. says, for this cause, let I be in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Say, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self word Says a bishop should not be self word And what is self word self word is that God has said it should be done this way. You go on doing it the way you want it to be done. You are self word God says that anyone who is self word and will not obey the way, the stipulation, what the, the, what the word has said, he says he's not qualified to be a leader in the house of God. But now in the churches, you just put people in positions, even though they cannot go by the word of God. If anyone is self word God says he is not qualified, and they read the Bible and it's there. It says if he's self word he's not qualified to be a leader. Because as a leader, you don't preach your mind. You don't preach your mind. It's his mind. It's his mind. And that is very important. And this applies to our lives also as Christians. Everything that you do is not what you want. So you can be a wife. You can be a wife in a Christian home. And you are facing problems. You don't go on to do what you want to do. You do what God wants you to do. So when you read Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. When we read Colossians chapter 3 from verse 22, it says, Servants, 
Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Then he goes on and says, And whatsoever ye do, do it happily, as to the Lord and not unto men. This is the secret to suffering and be successful in that call to suffer for God. This scripture is the secret. That as a Christian, you make it a point in life and also make your consciousness that anything that you do, you do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. Because if you live as doing things unto men and women, you cannot suffer. You cannot partake of the Christ, Christ sufferings. You have to do it as unto the Lord. And that is why you may be suffering. You, you, you may go be pursued, going through persecution, tribulations, and all manner of afflictions and reproaches. But because you know that you are doing it unto the Lord, it gives you joy. It gives you joy. But if you are doing it to your fellow human being, then that becomes a problem. And why is it that we should do it as unto the Lord and not unto men? It gives us the reason for that in the next verse. It says, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. It says, Since it's not your husband who is going to reward you at the day of judgment, since it's not your pastor who is going to reward you at that judgment day, since it's not your boss at work who is going to reward you. Since it's not your children who are going to reward you. Since it's not your mother and fathers who are going to reward you. And since it's God who is going to reward you. Therefore, do what I tell you to do in any circumstance. So he says, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. You are not serving men. You serve the Lord Christ. And then that's why we have this understanding that in the Christian journey, I am serving the Lord Christ. You will not compromise on any standard. You will say it as it's supposed to be. Say you act the way you are supposed to act, irrespective of the consequences. Whether people will love you or not, you know that you are serving the Lord Christ. You are not serving men. And that is what is very important. You have to understand that we are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not serving men. We are not serving men, but the Lord Jesus Christ. So this call of suffering is very important. We learn that positions goes with suffering, Christian positions, and this means spiritual positions. When you want promotion spiritually, it comes with suffering. You suffer and you are promoted and then when you grow, you grow up, you suffer. And as you are, the higher you go, the more suffering that comes. For instance, if you are a minister and God gives you a city, it comes a certain country and measure of suffering. If nations are added, the sufferings will continue. So it will increase. It will increase. So in position, spiritual position goes with sufferings. Also, character. Sufferings helps to mold our character, transform our character to be like Christ. Transforms our character to be like Christ. There are certain examples of people who suffered in the Bible. As we end there, I want us to look at some of them. Job was a man who suffered. Now, Satan can plant someone very close to you for you to suffer to even to test you for Job it was his wife the wife said curse God and die curse God and die but Job will not what do that so when Satan can plant people who are very close to you just to test and tempt you just to tempt you and that is why you have to be careful. Don't always think that people that Satan will use will come to be external. Some can be internal. Some can be internal. 
So it's very important we are cautious of this. Now, Job, in one day, lost all his children. He lost all his children, but he would not curse God. After that, he was afflicted in the body, boils all over. He would not curse God. But when you read Job chapter 42, Job chapter 42, after he went through everything when you read Job chapter 42 from the verse 12 from the verse 12 Job had his problems he said certain things you have said he erred in certain ways and when God came when you read from the chapter 38 coming God rebuked Job he rebuked Job sometimes many also don't understand the book of Job. So there are Christian people and they pick everything about Job to their life. It's not everything that we, about Job's life that a Christian should pick. So for instance, there are Christians who, when they are sick, they want to relate themselves, relate with Job. Relate with Job. What, what is the mystery behind Job's suffering? Job when we read Job chapter 1, the Bible lets you know that Satan went to accuse Job before God. Now in New Revelations, the Revelations chapter 12 calls Satan, the old serpent, calls him what? The accuser of the brethren. He's the false accuser of the brethren. But the Bible says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. At Job time, there wasn't any blood of the Lamb. Jesus had not come to die. Jesus had not come to die. And this time, that's why certain things had to be permitted. So, Satan came and then accused Job before God. And God allowed that for Job to go through these temptations. But Job was faithful to the end. So at the end of it all, when you read Job chapter 42 verse 12, the Bible says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job. More than what? His beginning. But between the beginning and the latter end, there was suffering. There isn't any spiritual promotion without suffering. So if you want to be promoted spiritually, then you must be willing to suffer. If you don't want to suffer, there is no spiritual promotion. And we are talking about suffering for righteousness. You are suffering for righteousness. You are suffering because of the word of God. You are suffering because of your testimony in Christ Jesus. So the Bible says, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. And if you go and you, and you compare it to the beginning, you see that everything was doubled. Everything was doubled for Job. But before that will come to pass, Job had to suffer. So when you are a Christian, you are a Christian, you are suffering for righteousness. That's why he's counted joy. You counted joy. It's an opportunity. You see, when you are serving God with your spirit, the way you see tribulation is even from the one who is fleshly minded. You see tribulations and persecution as well as an opportunity for promotion. And that's why in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, Paul calls it a privilege granted that to suffer for him. It's a privilege that we are granted to suffer for him because it comes with promotion. What about also about the Lord Jesus Christ? Now the question you have, if Job hadn't gone through this suffering, 
Would he have gotten this double blessing? No, it would not have been possible. So if you want promotion, that's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 20 told the disciples and also John, James and John that if you want to be promoted, then you have to drink my cup and be baptized of the baptism that I am baptized with. So it comes with that. Also, when you read Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, from verse 1. And when you are going through this suffering, it's not God bringing you the suffering, it's the enemy, but God is also what? Many times behind it. He allows these things to come to you. But this, I, I like what a great man of God many years ago, now he, he's there, he said, Smegho Oswald, he said that great faith comes by great fights. Great faith comes by great fight. If you want to grow in your faith walk with God, you have to fight battles. And the greater the battle, the greater the faith. He says, yeah, the Bible says, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit. Jesus was led up of the Holy Spirit into the water to be tempted of the devil. But who led Jesus to the water to be tempted? Is the Holy Ghost. Is the Holy Ghost. But did the temptation come from God? No, from the enemy. So the God many times will allow certain sufferings to come to you. But all these, they are to mold and bring in that inward godly character of Christ, which is in your spirit, out. And that is why it says that these tribulations, they work out patience. And patience will work out also that character that is supposed to bring forth. So it's for, it's for all our own advantage and all our own benefit. So the one who is spiritually minded, he sees the benefits, the spiritual benefits that comes with what? Tribulations and afflictions. The one who minds earthly things, when he goes, he can't go through tribulations and sufferings. But it's very important. It's very important. Now after Jesus went through this uh, wilderness temptation and past, the Bible says that he came in great power into the cities to preach the gospel. He came with mighty power into the cities. But he had to pass through this wilderness experience. And so it's not different, it was not different for him. That's why I say it was not different for Paul. He says, my power is made perfect in weakness. It's part, it's part of the journey, the process. So it's very important that we know that it's, it's, the, the process was not different for the Lord Jesus when he became a man. Therefore, it's not going to be different for us. And when you are going through this as a Christian, then you know that it's not, it's not that God has not loved you. Well, every Christian knows that God loved Jesus Christ. So if Jesus he loved and Jesus went through this, then we too, we should humble ourselves to go through that and win. And win. And win. Also, Paul himself also went through all these sufferings. He went through all these sufferings. He went through all these sufferings. Now, there is uh, another area I wanted to move into, but because of time, I cannot move into that. So, we will look at that in next week. But before we, 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 we end, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 20. 
says, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Many Christians, when they are reading this part of the Bible, they end up in the verse 22. But they don't complete it. After he said that all things are yours, he goes on to tell you that, and you are Christ. You belong to Christ. And Christ is God's. Letting you know that even though all things are yours, there's an order. Even though all things are yours, you yourself, you belong to Christ. Therefore, all those things which are yours, you have to understand that they first belong to Christ. Because if all things are yours, whether present or future, and you, that all those things belong to, belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God, that means that you and all the things that you possess, belongs to God. Now, if God, all the things you possess doesn't belong to God, then you don't belong to God. That's what Christians should understand. If everything that you own, if it doesn't belong to God, then you yourself, you don't belong to God. So you belonging to God means that you and all the possessions that you have belong to Him. So He tells you, what do you have that you didn't receive? God says, give me, tell me one thing that you have in your life. That is not me who gave it to you. And that's why Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 says that we brought nothing into this world. If you, you brought nothing to this world, then anything that you came and now you have it, you took it from this world. And you didn't create this world. So that's why I say everything that you have, he gave it to you. And that's why he says that if it is certain that when we go to, we will take nothing back. And that is the wisdom that we live as Christians. That you came to meet this world. Everything that now you have, you, you, you took it here. So God says that what do you have that you didn't receive? Now, if be, your wife, because of your wife, you will not serve God rightly. God is telling you that that wife, you receive her from, from me. So if that wife belongs to me, why then do you give me a reason that because of that wife, you cannot serve me? Why give me a reason because of that husband, you cannot serve me? Why give me a reason that because of that money, because of that work, you cannot serve me? Because what do you have that you didn't receive? Now, when we get this understanding as Christians that everything that we have, we receive from him. Then, when the true owner then comes to you to say, give up anything for my cause, you will not have it difficult to do that because you know that in the first place all those things belong to him but when we don't have this understanding then it becomes difficult for us to forsake all things for his cause unto the lord be the glory
that we trusted.